My name is Sepp, and I work on the Celo protocol. Um, and today I'm going to be talking about the future of value. Um, and what I'm going to start with, hold on, guys, 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 I'm starting my talk. <laughs> so <laughs> um, I, I want to start off by talking about painting. In the 1800s, there was uh, in the mid-1800s, there was a real big uh, explosion in technology innovation in painting. Um, in about 18, in 1841, uh, there was the invention of the paint tube. Um, and the paint tube, um, we don't think much about it now, but it was a real technology innovation because before the paint tube, the technology to hold paint was a pig's bladder. Um, and you can imagine that a pig's bladder wasn't very portable. There's a reason why you didn't see a lot of people painting outside, pa paintings of the outdoors. It's because people were pretty confined to their studio where they could hold their paints and mix their paints. Another invention around this time was the metal ferrule. The ferrule is the, that piece between the handle and the brush itself. Um, and prior to the metal ferrule, people used string or, or wire as the ferrule. And the problem with this is that it only allowed for uh, round brushes. With the metal ferrule, you all of a sudden could have flat brushes. Um, and so that, in turn, allowed for the impasto effect, uh, an effect where people put paint heavily on top of the, uh, of the brush and very quickly paint. And so together, these two technologies, along with a third technology, which, is, uh, which was the collapsible easel, led to a style of painting that we now call Impressionism. And this is both amazing and the story of the world. Um, there were these new technological innovations and these techn for an expressive medium. And the technological in innovations increased the expressive range of the, of the medium, and that allowed then lots of things, but including this, these works of unspeakable beauty. And this talk is, is not about painting, it's about money. Um, but I wanted to start with this because money is also an expressive medium. Um, it can express, its, its expressive range is very narrow. It can only express one thing, which is value. But it does a reasonable job at that. Um, and as we are now in a place where we're thinking about uh, we're in a place of technological innovation in the technology behind this expressive medium, it's useful to think about what are the features of money that would lead to more beauty? What are the features that would lead to a more beautiful world? And I would posit five. Um, none of these are new ideas. All of these are old, ide old ideas, but I believe they're ideas whose time has come. Um, the first is a universal basic income or a universal basic dividend um, that is tied directly into the money system. So that doesn't need to be implemented on top of the money system, but it's native to the money system. A basic income or a basic dividend, we see this a lot in nature. It's like sunlight or rain. Um, they're uh, a, a consistent source of energy that's reasonably evenly distributed in a region. And we see in nature, in places where there's lots of sunlight and lots of rain, we have biodiversity and bioprosperity. Um, and so that's the first feature, is a universal basic income or a universal basic dividend. The second feature is demurrage. And demurrage is an idea by the economist Silvio Gisell, who was active in the late 19th and early 20th century. And he observed that, you know, during times of recession, people tend to hoard money. And that hoarding of money ends up intensifying the recession. Um, and so he said, well, what's, what's the path out of this? And what he proposed was a small fee on the holding of money. Um, he called this negative interest or demurrage. And the way that he implemented it was he had these dollar bills. He proposed these dollar bills. But in order for the dollar bills to be valid, you'd have to affix a stamp each month to the dollar bill. And the stamp cost one cent. And during the Great Depression, there were lots of experiments with demerge charged currencies, most notably, in, most notably in Vorgel, Austria. And this is actually the, the Vorgel shilling, the demerge charged shilling. You can see the stamps on the right-hand side. Um, 
when it was issued in Vorgel, Vorgel became this oasis of prosperity in the midst of the Great Depression. People called it the miracle of Vorgel. And you saw these interesting things, like people started paying their taxes early, um, because in a demerage charged world, it actually makes sense to pay your taxes early. So that's the second feature, is demerage. And demerage, if you think about a UBI as rain, demerage can be seen as evaporation. So it, uh, it, it helps to circulate the energy and avoid stagnation. The third feature is, is um, an idea by a philosopher I love named Charles Eisenstein um, called natural capital backed currencies. And he basically observed, he says, you know, whatever backs money, people tend to make more of um, because it's like printing money. Uh, so when gold backed money, there was this intense incentive to mine gold. And so what Charles said is he said, well, why don't we back money with things that we like? like pristine forests and clean rivers. Um, and I think that's a lovely idea. So that's the third feature. It's called natural capital backed currencies. The fourth feature, for lack of a better term, I'll call an ecology of value. And I think the best way I can describe it is to give an analogy to the early days of the internet. Um, I remember in the early internet, um, there was this excitement around like, whoa, like we could use this to put the Encyclopedia Britannica online. Um, and yes, we could, and yes, that was useful. But what it did was it actually borrowed a, a, an earlier metaphor where information was an object rather than an ecology. We had a monoculture of information. And what we thought about was to make that monoculture more efficient. But in practice, what the internet allowed was a polyculture of information. It allowed uh, an ecosystem of information. Um, and I can imagine the same thing for value. I can imagine that we will have a diversity of local currencies, of regional currencies, of national fiat currencies, of global reference currencies, of utility currencies, of store of value currencies, medium of exchange currencies, all filling niches that it doesn't make sense for the others to fill and creating a polyculture with all of the resilience that um, that, that entails. And finally, the fifth feature is the creation of money in a manner that's not concomitant with the creation of new debt. Um, so right now, all money is created through debt. And uh, the consequence of that is that there's always more debt than there is money. Uh, we can never pay off our debts. Um, and I'd argue that at the beginning of the industrial age, that was actually a feature. Um, it impels growth. It incentivizes growth. And growth has been good to us. But I think now, as we start to reach the carrying capacity of the Earth, it's not clear to me that growth in mean consumption is the way to solve our problems. Uh, and it certainly is not clear to me that we should tie the medium of exchange to the incentive for that growth. Um, so those are the five features. They're universal basic income, demerage, natural capital-backed currencies, and ecology of value and creating money in a manner that's not concomitant with the creation of new debt. Uh, those of you here will probably recognize that a lot of the technologies that the crypto community has been building addresses some of these. So for example, block rewards are a way to create new money without creating, without creating new debt. Uh, tokens are a technology by which we can create an ecology of value. Smart contracts will allow, allow for demerage, um, although for demerage to really work, we'd also want stability of value. And the UBI and natural capital backed currencies are, are the hardest because the technologies that, that we're building are the most nascent. Um, they are technologies around identity and stability. So what I want to do today is I want to just take a little dive into the idea of natural capital capital-backed currencies, and propose sketches of an implementation for it. Um, I, I'm interested in the proposal and the sketch, but I'm more interested in the kind of thinking that it'll, uh, it'll provoke. Um, so let's start with a, a stable value coin, a, a decentralized crypto-backed stable value coin. Um, so, so the stable value coin has a reserve of of other coins, and it's over collateralized. Um, it also has transaction fees and mining rewards go to the reserve 
um, variable so that based on the reserve ratios so that we can mitigate volatility. But kind of at base, we can think about it as an over collateralized crypto backed coin. The key insight here is that the more the demand for the stable coin, the more algorithmic purchases of the reserve assets. So the, because it's fully backed. So the, the greater the demand for the stable coin, the greater the demand for the reserve assets. And so that gives us a lot of flexibility when we think about um, making, that, that makes it interesting when we think about reserve asset composition. So, I mean, right now there's not a lot of assets that we could imagine putting into the reserve, but over time there will be. You could imagine tokenization of real assets. You can to imagine tokenization of commodities that get put into the reserve. You can also imagine that over time people will start tokenizing pristine forests. And so then if, we, if the community through governance says something like 10% of the reserve is allocated to tokenized forest land, what it does is it gives an immediate demand for tokenized forest. And as the monetized realm in the stablecoin grows, so does the demand for natural capital. It's lovely. Um, so the only challenge is that, well, how do we know that this tokenized forest land is actually for real? Um, one way we could do it is we could have somebody like the World Wildlife Fund sign, um, sign the coin, basically attesting, saying this is legitimately a tokenized forest. Um, but what, what if we don't know enough about the World Wild, Wildlife Fund? Um, or what if it's a local NGO or a local municipality? Um, what we really need is we need a trust score for the attester. Um, and so I'll talk a little bit about, I, I gave a talk on a protocol that I worked on several years ago called Eigentrust um, earlier this week. And I'll give like the two slide summary of it of it in, in this context. So we take that attester and we say, okay, um, we want to find some way to trust, how, how much should we trust that attester? A naive way to, is to say, well, how many people know that attester and trust that attester? And so we can just sum over all the people who trust that attester. Um, the problem is that that attester could create a thousand sybils, and those thousand sybils could all say that they trust this attester. And so what we'll do is we'll just make a little tweak on it where we, we will say, you know, we're going to sum all of the people who trust the attester, but weight their trust by their global trust scores. And then, and so what you do, what we do is we define a recursive algorithm in which somebody's trust is defined by a global trust score is defined by how many people trust them, weighted by their global trust scores, which is in turn defined by how many people trust them, weighted by their global trust scores, and so on and so forth. There's a ton of, uh, there's a ton of detail in the paper um, on how to address adversarial co collect, uh, collectives or how to do this in a decentralized way. Um, but I'm going to be, I'm not going to talk about it in this talk. Mostly what I wanted to do in this talk is briefly introduce three high-level ideas from narrow to broad. The first high-level idea is that I think as a community, we can have a really big impact on the environment through the introduction of things like natural capital-backed currencies, and even more specifically in the idea of having stable coins with forest reserves, uh, forest, forest tokens in the reserve. The second, uh, the second idea that I wanted to bring, out, bring up is there are a lot of things that we want to both incentivize and reward through, through certain protocols that are not done through machines. And because they're not done through machines, they're difficult to have cryptographic proofs around. Um, for example, we may want to incentivize and reward planting trees or putting solar panels on your roof. Or even more basically, we may want to incentivize and reward being a person. Um, and while these are very difficult to do through cryptographic proofs, 
um, eigentrust weighted attestations are a great step, a great initial step forward in thinking about how to evaluate claims that can't be done through cryptographic proofs. And then the third, and this comes very much at the beginning of, of the talk, is that I think as we're in this space of rapid innovation around this expressive medium, I think beauty is really important. Like I think if we can envision in detail a more beautiful world, um, it'll help to guide the kinds of technologies that we build. So I wanna conclude with a story. Um, this is the story of a city in Brazil called Curitiba. And in the early 90s, they had a really thoughtful mayor. And the mayor noticed, well, he had observed that basically in the favelas around Curitiba, the roads were too narrow for the garbage trucks. And so garbage was collecting in the favelas and spilling over into the river. So what he did was, was amazing, it was fascinating. He started a program in which there was also an underutilized bus service. So he started a program in which um, people were given bus tokens in exchange for garbage. And so what happened was people started collecting garbage, getting bus tokens, and using them to go downtown to find work. Um, and what happened next was even more amazing. At a certain point, those tokens started circulating in the favelas as currency, and that, currency ended up being making it possible for people to collect more garbage than they needed bus tokens. And so what we had is we had this, this, this token that was really a, a stable value token backed by public transportation, earned into existence through environmental remediation, um, and it gave dignity and meaningful work and environmental re remediation to a community that needed it. I could imagine thousands of these. Um, so that's, this is the kind of story that I think I'd love for us as a community to enable. Um, just to finish up, uh, as I said, I work on the Cello Protocol and the Cello community, we're thinking about problems like this all the time. So if you're interested in these kinds of problems, We'd love to have you join us. Uh, you can follow us at cellohq or cello.org. Thank you very much.